We have a very interesting topic. We're going to cover 20 years, and we've just lost uh, 20 minutes, I think. So we've got a big challenge in front of us. But the, the title of this uh, of our topic is the ICC in the next 20 years. And I'm very pleased to be here with a very distinguished uh, panel. I think the question that's put to us is a very provocative one, but I think it's an important one. Uh, we don't know what the next 20 years is going to look like, but we do know some of the challenges already. And I think uh, has been alluded to today many times, the accountability movement, the human rights movement, you know, dating back uh, to the Universal Declaration, and obviously, uh, more recently, the Rome Statute, uh, is, in a sense, cr in crisis. Uh, we find ourselves in a very difficult situation with the rise of authoritarianism and the emergence of, quote unquote, the strong man. I don't say the strong woman because the people I'm thinking of are men. Uh, but in a whole range of countries, obviously the United States, but a number of other important and powerful countries. So these factors are, I think, a crisis and obviously have a serious impact on the court and on its mission. And I don't think we can separate the crisis from the work of the, of the court. Uh, so a lot's happened since Rome, um, and, and there have been uh, not only this very stiff uh, headwinds that we've been discussing today and the current climate, but we also have, and I think this is important, and I don't think we've talked about this much today, we have a new generation of activists. We have, unfortunately, a new generation of victims as well. And their voices, I think, are going to be extremely important for the, for the future. And I think their perspectives need to be taken into account. Uh, and I think they rightly want to raise their voices as well. Uh, and we need to be supporting them. So even though the ICC and the human rights movement generally faces some very deep challenges, uh, we really must not only be aware of the challenges, but also working together for solutions and working to fight back. Uh, so I think the question for us here on this discussion today and going forward is how do we respond to the challenges? Uh, how does the court do its work in a difficult uh, and challenging time? Uh, I think if we are serious about addressing these challenges, for the ICC, we've got some very big questions to deal with, and I don't think they're simply about the organization of the court or um, the leadership of the court, but they involve much bigger issues. Uh, and I think if we're going to address these challenges that really lie behind the title of our, uh, our discussion today, the ICC in the next 20 years, we need as an, an imperative to ensure that the next generation of activists, their voices begun, start coming to the fore. I was in Rome um, 20 years ago uh, and lots of prep comms and so forth. I probably look 20 years older and 20 years from now, uh, I hope to be uh, enjoying a, a nice retirement, if not something else. Christian is the only one that looks the same 20 years from 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know how he does it, but uh, I'm sure from 20 years from now he will look the same and he will be here. But there will be many others to, to, to uh, step in the shoes of the activists today. So I think it's important to have a you know, good discussion and think about this. We obviously can't predict the future, but we do need to think about how to address some of the, court, the court's issues going forward and how we energize and bring in a new group of, of activists and a new generation of activists and obviously others who are going to be participating in the court. Uh, an earlier discussion, I think, uh, highlighted the need to um, address and deal with the question of complementarity, however we phrase it. Um, this really is a critical issue to deal with uh, in the future, and as our discussion earlier today showed, that we still have a long way to go.
And I think we also, in this vein, need to think of the Rome Statute as a system and not simply as a single court, and to bear that in mind. Um, there are a lot of issues for us, and I think particularly for younger act activists to address those, these, these issues. Um, so it's a difficult climate, and we'll be talking about these issues in a difficult climate. Um, there are positive developments that have been uh, highlighted today, and I would simply note those. Uh, I won't repeat them. One thing that strikes me is I think that the court and the prosecutor has handled the Columbia situation adroitly. Um, thus far, it's still an emerging situation, but I don't think the court has gotten enough credit with, uh, with this regard. Um, obviously, the, 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 the uh, referral and the, the seeking the referral on the Rohingya, the Almaty case, there are a number of uh, successes or positive developments that I think we should bear in mind. Uh, but with that short introduction, I wanted to turn to uh, uh, our panelists, and uh, we've got very distinguished panelists, uh, and I guess I have to tell them to be brief, but uh, being brief sometimes is more impactful. So uh, we will, do, we will uh, start here with Professor Clark, who uh, has already made an appearance or two from the floor, and we're very glad to have her. She uh, is a professor of international and global studies um, and legal studies at Carleton University. And Pro Professor Clark, much of your research and writing has focused on accountability, uh, on the court, on Africa as well, I think. Um, and obviously, we've, we've witnessed a, a number of developments, uh, both in Africa and with the court. And I, I wanted to ask you how um, you see the trajectory of the court, maybe not over the next 20 years, but certainly over the, the short and medium term, and how the, uh, how the organs of the court might adjust their current trajectory. So I'll start with you and give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, David, and, and of course, thank you to uh, Vivine and uh, Klaus for the invitation to be here, as well as uh, the Nuremberg Group. Um, many, of the, it's, many of the issues have been discussed in many ways, and I think we have the, the difficult task of both projecting as well as dealing and dwelling within the somber realities of our time. And when I reflect on the African region and the work ahead, there, there are a number of things that I'd like to map out um, in highlighting some of the major challenges ahead as it relates to future action on the part of uh, the ICC and the larger international justice assemblages as a whole. Um, so in this context then, in terms of the major challenges, of course, we're dealing with the aftermath of civil wars in, many, in a number of sub-Saharan African uh, countries, uh, financial insecurity, electoral challenges, increasing radicalism, uh, uh, religious radicalism in, in many senses, the, the rise of Boko Haram, for example, as well as uh, other uh, groups, uh, the depletion of state institutions in the sub, uh, sub region. Uh, of course, we know the lack of land tenure reform is at the heart of significant violence that, that we've seen. We can look to, to Kenya and elsewhere around some of those questions. Pervasive illicit resources, illicit retractions, um, uh, mercenarism, uh, paramilitary organizations, uh, a range of problems that are both historical and contemporary that have to do with the, the, the nature of violence today and, and perhaps might push us to reflect on what some of the root causes of, of the contemporary violence that we're seeing, in, including in the situation countries. And so I wanted to start by, in, in thinking about the major challenges, to, to highlight that that in part the, the challenges and the, the historical and the contemporary issues that we're seeing are political 
deeply political. And um, I'll return to this point a bit later when, when we reflect on um, solutions or strategies. But in saying that they're political, in many ways, they, um, I was quite uh, pleased with uh, David Scheffler's remark on the panel and the, 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 a strategy around putting in place a panel that would take on some of the political and diplomatic work. And it's certainly at the heart of some of the solutions or strategies that I will discuss later. Um, in the African region, it's the panel of the wise, the idea, the, the, the constitution of these, uh, these bodies with senior um, states persons who are engaged in diplomatic negotiation, political settlement, etc. And at the heart of that, in, and in the recognition of some of the deeply political problems, is a recognition that, that at times there are limits to the work that courts can do, and at times uh, political strategies are necessary given the nature of uh, the social, economic, political problems at, at their heart. And so, um, so as we think about the major challenges, then one has to do with the nature of political problems and the, the, the ways that we, or, or the, the modalities or the mechanisms that we should turn to for that regard, in that regard. And so there, I'll, I'll start by thinking about the, the, the political nature of such violence and the need for political solutions and um, legal solutions being one of a much larger domain uh, for addressing these, um, these crises and forms of inequalities uh, in, in the sub-region. Uh, another point, um, and Erica spoke to this very nicely, I, I call this the law people see, which is some of the histories of mistrust, whether it's recent histories of um, certain institutions, the histories of neocolonialism, disenchantment, uh, that that the, the articulations of racism as a result of uh, reflecting on selectivity of cases, um, that many of these declarations or these statements, I should say, these statements reflect much deeper histories that, that we need to contend with. And this was a point I think that, that Erica did raise importantly, but this is also a major challenge moving forward as we think about what some of the strategies will be. What is the historical debate? What are the discourses that are at play, what are the, 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 the easy and strategic um, tropes that are used as well as the quite legitimate tropes that are invoked, sometimes conveniently, sometimes not as conveniently. Um, we might also think about the, the state of um, those who are, have been victimized by violence and some of the structural problems with linking on the part of the ICC uh, case victims to uh, the result of cases, the dissatisfaction of many um, in the subcontinent around uh, the way that the ICC has handled victims. This is a challenge that we need to, to reflect on as we move forward and um, consider the next 20 years. Uh, I, I, the fourth point is withdrawals and pledges of non-cooperation. I think this is important and um, I raised it as a question earlier, uh, but in, in many ways the, these Part of the, the, the important point here by way of uh, pledges of non-cooperation or uh, statements of withdrawal is not so much um, is to recognize the political nature of these utterances, the political nature of these discourses, that, that to, to make a declaration, what is the, the productive work of a declaration? Um, and it, it's, it's not so much that we think it's a good or bad thing, it's that in the, in the play of politics, what does a declaration do? And what does it enable and what does it foreclose? And this is a challenge ahead uh, to think about the, the AU's Pledge of Non-Cooperation, Ella al-Bashir. Um, this is a major challenge ahead, but the, 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 what does that declaration do? Uh, what does the Pledge of Non-Cooperation do in withdrawals, I think, is, is important to, to, to recognize and contend with. Um, uh, of course, uh, the lack of universal jurisdiction and the claim that um, uh, there's de jure and de facto um, immunity on the part of the ICC. Um, so those states that have de facto immunity are those that aren't part of the, the regime um, and uh, the conditions under which certain states are um, and cases are selected uh, have to do, of course, and is connected to the law people see, which isn't unimportant. It isn't unrelated to the dimensions ahead and the challenges ahead. Um, it, it speaks to the layout and the layout of power and politics uh, in the international sphere. 
And so with that, the, 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 the last point that I would like to raise then in relation to major challenges is, is connected to the emergence of sub-regional courts. And of course, the, the Malibu Protocol for the African Court, um, this, that particular um, legal doct doctrine that many of us do see as a protest treaty in many ways, if we look at the immunity provision 46A bis, indeed, it, it isn't unrelated to the history of the ICC and the um, indictments of heads of state. But if we think about the, the formation and rise of such an institution uh, as a possibility or an opportunity for putting in place sub-regional institutions that can address some of the core crimes, I, I think that there is an opportunity there. It's both a challenge and an opportunity because of the nature of the, 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 mal the protocol itself, immunity on one hand. On the other hand, the introduction of 14 crimes, four of which are already Rome Statute crimes, but the other uh, crimes are crimes of, many of them of an economic nature. Uh, so if we think about piracy, terrorism, mercenaryism, corruption, money laundering, the trafficking of persons, trafficking of drugs, um, uh, trafficking of hazardous waste, and the list goes on, that these are crimes that are fundamentally, that are seen as the, the crimes of greatest concern to the African community. And so many of us in, in reflecting on the Rome Statute and in reflecting on the ICC, we talk about crimes of concern to humanity. What we have with the Rome Statute is what I call a form of reattribution. Um, what we have with the, Af the African court is what I call a form of reattribution in which African states are saying there are challenges here with the nature of the Rome Statute. If we put in place a new mechanism, uh, this mechanism should address crimes that are at the heart of violence, not crimes that are secondary, that are political crimes, like genocide, crimes against humanity, etc. But part of what they're saying is that these other crimes are enabling crimes. These are actually the crimes that are at the heart of the violence that we're seeing, that are emerging. And if we are going to make a difference and engage, one of the ways to do it is to identify the subject matter jurisdiction of the court uh, in relation to crimes that are of concern. Of course, the challenge then, so I raise that to then end with the, the challenge, with this, which has to do with capacity. It has to do with funding. Um, it has to do with the, the immunity provision and a number of other components that, that are part of the landscape as we look forward. Uh, but I think it's, it's certainly a, a good place to start in thinking about the challenges ahead, both the benefits and the, the use value of, of imagining such, such an institution and what it could do and what it might do uh, in the future. Uh, as well as the challenges ahead, and, and it's not um, unlike the challenges that we see that, that the ICC is, is facing today. That's, that's great. Can I, can I ask you just one quick, uh, well, send a, I'll ask a quick answer to an impossible question. How about that? Um, hmm. um, because I think we see this in many areas, uh, the failure to address these underlying economic crimes that drive conflict, that whether, whether it's about um, you know, valuable minerals, whether it's about corruption. And in many ways, you know, the human rights movement in general has missed out on that, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the things that fuel populism is that mm -hmm. we have this, this kind of overarching set of human rights and we have the court and so forth, but we don't really get at some of the economic inequality. Now, this is a much longer discussion, so I'm not going to be, I'll only give you 30 seconds to, to, to quickly respond, and we can get into it later. But I'd be curious just to hear your views on, on, on those issues. On economic yeah, inequalities? Yeah, right, yeah. I, in part, this is what I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm suggesting as we think about the possibilities for a court that includes economic crimes, that is suggesting that we bring these crimes to the level of um, international law and international criminal law, that it's, it's one thing to identify genocide as a crime. It's another thing to look at the enabling conditions under which genocide uh, take shape, whether it's you know through a, a number of other resource negotiations. Um, we, I, I suppose I should uh, say that the the Malibu Protocol introduces criminal accountability, criminal corporate accountability. So, in thinking about economic crimes, part of it is saying that that 
corporations are in the midst of Sudanese violence. Uh, corporations are still extracting oil. That that there are ways that that corporations. Uh, are also part and parcel, and we need to look at this legally, and we need to think about uh, culpability in different ways, um, and that the, the current legal mechanisms that are available to us are insufficient. And so I think that, I mean, there certainly are provocative possibilities, and, and I like the themes uh, from today in many ways, the, the suggestion that there, that there are many instruments and, and institutions that are part of this assemblage that have to participate in the, this assemblage of justice, international justice as we know it. And it, it means that the ICC is not the only game in town. And 20 years from now, we would hope that it isn't, given the nature of violence and the inability of uh, a legal institution to address some of these deeply political problems. And so I, I think in many ways the economic questions are really at the core here and um, even with its challenges, uh, something like the Malibu Protocol for the uh, African Court could, if, if it were to take off through a cooperation with the international community, um, it could provide some possibilities that, that are quite viable. So in, in my own recommendations, when we talk about the future and, and reflect on recommendations moving forward, one of them does have to do with supporting the ratification of, of the, the instrument at the moment. Um, and some of the work that we've been doing with the um, with um, funding through the Open Society has involved the the legal research for um, uh, the African Union Legal Council for the ratification of the statute. And at the moment, there are 11 signatures and um, zero ratifications because of a whole set of complex issues that aren't unrelated to uh, the ICC and the indictment of heads of state. So, um, so, so there are a lot of issues ahead, and it, I think it's complex just as the ICC experiment is uh, an aspiration that is complex and deeply fraught with political and structural challenges. But 20 years from now, um, we would hope that uh, you know this is a domain that people will continue to to work on and and mobilize around. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Barbara Lockbiller, who is a member of the European Parliament and very uh, active on human rights issues. Uh, she and I met years ago uh, on these issues, so it's good to see her again. Um, and I wondered if you could uh, address what the European Union is, you know, the European Union has really played, a, and the European Union countries as well, but the Union itself has played a very important role in supporting the International Criminal Court. Um, we've already talked a bit about you know, populism and authoritarianism, but how do you see the European Union connection to the court and um, its work supporting the court going forward into the into the future. What are your thoughts? Uh, I I think you're at sort of at the end of your time uh, in the in the parliament, and you're going to be entering civil society with some of the rest of us. So it would be interesting to have your frank views uh, at this juncture. <laughs> okay. I think also as a parliament member, I am always very frank. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that the European Union, you always have to think as a triangle. The Commission, the Council, these are all the member states in the parliament. And maybe I haven't planned to start with him, but uh, maybe I have to quote Mr. Bolton again, or his statement. Because this uh, statement in September tempted our so-called foreign minister, Federica Mogherini, of the High Representative of the European Union in the plenary in Strasbourg to uh, make a statement which we have not asked for actually. We usually criticize her that she could be more outspoken in support of the ICC, but in relation to the uh, Bolton statement she said, today the existence of the International Criminal Court is being questioned and I think it is important to say in this hemicycle formally and clearly that it is not questions by the European Union and that we will continue to strongly and fully support the ICC and its work. It's when the victims feel powerless, when crimes are met with impunity, that reconciliation is much harder to achieve and that accountability is essential to build the foundation for peace. 
So the court may not be perfect, but the best way forward for us is not to dismantle our global institutions. The way forward for us is to make them stronger and to build strong, more effective multilateral systems. Mm -hmm. So that was a very good and a very strong um, statement. Um, as you have asked what the Europe, what I, let's say, what I would hope uh, for the European Union, that also in the next uh, 20 years, uh, they are a strong supporter of the ICC and even stronger than now. So the EU has a lot of different um, mechanisms to support it. Since 2011, there was a council decision and an action plan uh, how to strengthen the ICC. So there are political dialogues, demarches, clauses in agreements and so on, letters from the high representative, and also how the EU presents itself and positions itself in the UN. I have to make this now very short um, in terms of time. Um, and I think um, the EU is not, the Commission is not changing its policies. But we have uh, elections in May na uh, next year, and this means after the elections we will also have a new uh, composition of uh, the Commission and a much more far-right and right-wing uh, uh, parliament. So all the uh, issues with uh, strengthening multilateralism um, versus uh, nationalism or uh, issues like uh, having a strong human rights focus in the EU's foreign policies or strengthening the ICC, it's not so easy to, will, uh, to be able to get majority for this. We have to see this. And we have countries uh, like Austria, Poland and Hungary who really don't uh, ex uh, respect very much the rule of law, also not the EU rule of law or see them, uh, the other uh, requirements there. So I think we have to be alarmed. And here when I say we, I think then uh, to the parliament level, I am a member of the European, um, uh, European Parliament, but a member of uh, a network of parliamentarians for global actions. And they were in Rome and also followed in Kampala. That's where I met them. And I think uh, this network of the parliamentarians is very, uh, important, not only because I'm a member, but I think they have at home um, to follow what their governments do or not do and also to uh, uh, translate what is the task of the ICC to the uh, populations. And the PGA has, uh, since its existent, uh, existence, I think, um, contributed uh, with advice. We have a very good uh, office in New York and Den Haag um, to domestic decision-making processes in 77 countries. And we also need, of course, more uh, ratifications. And there, again, we could see um, what the parliaments and where political situations are changes, changing. And we do need more ratifications. And of course, we, uh, I also uh, see this, that uh, um, election results will uh, always, in recent history, go to the wrong side yeah, and to ask for more authoritarian states. But let's see, for example, differences in Malaysia, mm -hmm. where also the colleagues now in this network hardly push the new government to ratify. I mean, last week they have the cabinet has decided to abolish the death penalty. So you can see if there is really a change in the political will and the leadership of a country. So we have as a network to see where this is possible. And then of course we see uh, that the EU has signed some of um, agreements with East European countries like um, Georgia or the Ukraine. And then we also work on this. Now, what else would I hope for? I think um, in the next 20 years, I think we have to hope that the states will be in a good shape because they have to um, support uh, the court. And so the state parties need to be very strong and have a very pro-court uh, pro uh, attitude. And I also hope that the court will be a court for the victims. And I think um, this is, easy to be said, but it needs a lot of improvement, how the court perhaps is operating now. 
and I may quote the study of the Open Society Justice Initiative from 2016 on um, witness interferences, and they say that um, witness interference has been alleged in nearly every case before the ICC. It is one of the most urgent challenges facing the court and international criminal justice. So I think perhaps this is an area where we have to, or where the court needs to, uh, to improve, and also the state parties. Um, Yes, and I think uh, the, um, I skipped this now. The other panels have, have spoken on the complementarity as well. Mm, let me perhaps say on the withdrawal um, uh, of states from the uh, statute. Um, I think the attempt of some African states, orchestrated by the previous leadership of the African Union, was that you have a massive withdrawal of 33 uh, countries. So within PGA, we took this very serious. So we reached out to all uh, those parliaments where we had members, what we could do. And when I uh, followed also the uh, work of the European Union, uh, the Commission and the External Action Service, there was a huge uh, silent, I would say not very visible, um, uh, approach uh, to the different uh, African states not to do so. And I think I consider this actually a success. There's finally, there was no massive withdrawal. There are basically um, two countries, Burundi, which I think was a hopeless case, uh, the given situation, and South Africa. And I think South Africa was very good, the court system in South Africa itself, but I assume also the, the dynamics in the INC and uh, the critique of uh, the leadership uh, took uh, ground. So I think this kind of work, what the EU can do to assist uh, the countries who, who want to use the ICC to bring justice also the, to their uh, people, this should be uh, strengthened. And um, I don't actually uh, don't know if you have meant this, but I think in, in discussing uh, with uh, parliamentarians from Africa, very often when they come here, we have a quite rough, uh, maybe in a political area that's usual um, uh, terminology, and it said, well, this EU interference is a kind uh, of a neo-colonial attitude, and also that the court is a kind of, uh, is a kind of uh, example of white justice. But um, I think what I see is that a lot of African uh, people who suffered uh, war crimes and survived some, they don't argue and speak like this. And this is very helpful also to quote them in talking with uh, other parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. uh, because then it becomes very clear that a lot of African uh, governments and institutions come to the ICC to ask for support and help. So, and I, uh, I, I have to say it also um, was good to address this point of uh, historical responsibilities, yes, but then also to be very specific in the criticism and not uh, so general. Okay, so maybe I stop here? Yeah, I, we'll, okay. we'll come back. Um, lots of very good points there, and uh, it might be interesting to talk uh, a little bit later about the countries in Europe which are sort of turning toward populism and not supporting the court, and what some of the uh, advocacy strategies might be uh, in relation to that. But we'll come back on the next, on the next round for that. Um, I'm going to turn to Judge Song, who is well known in uh, this, uh, this forum and in this uh, audience. Um, Judge Song, I wonder if you could address a, a, a kind of an intertwined questions. One, one is, obviously, we're in Nuremberg, and the Nuremberg principles uh, uh, originated here. Um, what role do you see the Nuremberg principles playing, uh, playing out in the present in the court, uh, the present situation in the court, but also on the long term? And when we think about the future, um, the relevance and the importance of the Nuremberg principles. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before uh, discussing uh, Nuremberg principles and anything else, uh, or, or serious challenges uh, um, to the uh, ICC, I think it impaired, uh, well, the, the future of the ICC would be by and large dependent upon two things. One, how well and how properly the court will operate as a judicial institution. Two, uh, how much and how diligently the state's parties uh, will support and cooperate with the, uh, with the court uh, in, in many ways. These, it's a simple, in my view, it's a simple. It's, it's a, the future of the court depends upon these two things. Mm -hmm. And in order to uh, deal with the first thing, I think it imperative, uh, based on my personal own uh, experience and perspective, uh, to carefully nominate and elect for the bench of the ICC the best qualified legal professionals, well equipped uh, with high ethical standards and judicial experience, fit for properly carrying out international criminal matters. Um, <clears throat> I don't mean to say that all the previous elected officials were bad, but uh, this is a very important issue. Uh, one way in this direction uh, was to introduce uh, the um, Advisory Committee for Nomination, or ACN, um, as a kind of filtering mechanism for nominees for the bench. Uh, ACN, in my view, should be um, substantively more uh, strengthened and uh, made more effective. In addition, I, uh, I suggest that uh, there should be a similar mechanism for prosecutor and uh, deputy prosecutor, and um, even for a registrar. Um, because I believe the ICC's future, as I said uh, earlier, it depends in large part on their uh, the leadership and sense of devotion, or even Weltanschauung of these elected officials. Um, actually, the, uh, the objectives and goals of the court that are set out in the Rome Statute uh, are now, in my view, in, in jeopardy. Uh, as you all know, Article 27 in particular, in which the Nuremberg Principles is fully enshrined, has been challenged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I discreetly contacted quite a few uh, leading states parties who, who you know, uh, quite strongly supported uh, ICC and ICC causes. You know, just to ask them to come forward and speak up on behalf of the court. No state party did that. Oh, we have a candidate for the ICC bench. Oh, we are running for a seat in the Security Council. We don't want to lose African vote. You, Mr. President, you should uh, speak up uh, on behalf of your own court. Do you think that's proper? No, and then in the end, and then I, when I said, no, no way, and then, why don't you get your, the legal officer of the ICC to come forward and speak up uh, on, uh, on behalf of the entire court? This was uh, the experience I had. So it's, uh, it's, uh, we, you know, in terms of the uh, state's party cooperation and support issue, this is a pretty, uh, a very serious one in my view. Uh, <clears throat> So it, it is a state's party, I, I want to re-emphasize, it is a state's party's duty to diligently defend all the objectives and goals of the statute based on the Nuremberg principles. 
uh, the Rome statute system will be as important for the near future as it is, uh, <clears throat> it is now. Uh, for uh, it would be uh, the uh, most effective system for peace and security for the international community so far, in my view. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, in terms of deterrence, the court would have the possibility to increase its influence in future conflicts as long as the target for the court's investigation and prosecution is well selected and effectively pursued. It may be a big if, but uh, you know, this, you know, I would say so. Uh, uh, for, uh, by the way, for a deterrence effect, the Nuremberg Academy's publication entitled Two Steps Forward and One Step Backward is uh, rather inspiring uh, about the deterrence effect. Uh, the, the real challenges, of course, I, I can identify the whole list of challenges that will, <coughs> the ICC will have to be faced with, but uh, the new and uh, real challenges to the ICC uh, have been partly wrought by the, uh, the steady collapse of the post-war order. Um, as one commentator, uh, David Brooks of the NYT, uh, has noted, the post-war order uh, was a kind of a great uh, historic achievement. The founding generation uh, built a series of organizations and alliances to fight communism, to protect uh, human rights, and combat uh, global poverty, and, and uh, promote uh, democracy. It's, it's, been, uh, it's based on the idea that the nations have uh, common values, uh, a shared historical accomplishment, and a carefully nurtured set of uh, uh, relationships, and live in a, um, a community of general friendship and trust. With the re recent rise of populism and authoritarianism, however, the world is now uh, perceived increasingly as a war of all against all. Um, some government leaders are trying to transform the nature of the post-war order uh, and uh, take every re uh, relationship that has historically been based on uh, trust and reciprocity and turn that into a relationship that uh, is based on uh, competition, self-interest, and um, suspicion, and efforts to mm -hmm. establish dominance. So the, the impact of the declining post-war order in this regard, the possible consequences that these have on the ICC and uh, potential clash with the U.S., uh, given the uh, John Bolton's um, you know, speech, would have to be uh, very attentively, diligently, and constantly addressed uh, with the strong support of the states and civil society. In the, in the long run, it is up to the states who created the court and its other supporters to, to identify actions that can be taken. In this regard, the, the ASP uh, uh, <clears throat> will consider as a matter of priority um, you know, how they can best use the, the uh, political and diplomatic tools at their disposal to bring about cooperation by states, which is a treaty obligation. The, the court should also build up a very close relationship with regional organizations such as European Union, even uh, organization of American states, uh, the La Francophonie, the, the Commonwealth, or GCC, or ASEAN, and, and so on. It's, you see, the, we have to uh, just uh, get some support, not only from the states parties, but also from the, all the, uh, the international organizations and uh, uh, civil society. 
the, <clears throat> the need for support and cooperation goes far beyond the, the technical issues. You know how to collect evidence, and uh, you, 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 you guys, uh, states uh, have to, uh, you know, uh, implement uh, certain ways for uh, uh, witness protection or uh, the uh, evidence collection. That's a technical uh, level issue, but it's, it's, it goes far beyond that to the political support that ICC requires. This is nowhere more evident uh, than with the uh, Security Council referrals. In the Sudan and Libya situations, so no one has been uh, addressed and tried. Uh, rather, in June two, 2012, uh, it took me 26 sleepless days and nights, nights to get the release of four detained uh, court officials uh, through uh, intensive negotiations. Unfortunately, the Security Council has not provided the court uh, with the help it needs to discharge uh, the mandate given to it in the Security Council uh, resolutions. A far more consistent and vigilant approach uh, uh, is, is, is needed. Uh, and uh, there's uh, also a financial question that requires attention. Uh, the Rome Statute and the relationship agreement between the ICC and the UN anticipate that the uh, UN will help uh, uh, fund the costly investigations and prosecutions arising from the uh, Security Council referrals. In, in both Sudan and Libya resolutions, a, a provision was rather added uh, prohibiting UN funds from uh, helping the ICC. So states parties had to pick up the bill uh, for the work done by the ICC uh, stemming from a Security Council decision adopted on behalf of the entire world community in order to preserve peace and security. This conflict will uh, need to be addressed in the near future, but not easy uh, to resolve without a constructive approach by all countries on the Security Council, including the, uh, the U.S. Okay. Uh, that, may I? Uh, oh, yeah, that's a, a few more minutes. Okay. Yeah. A few more minutes? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think we need to... The, yeah. You know, also, efforts uh, must also uh, continue to preserve uh, the political neutrality of the ICC. Um, you know, it is uh, politically, ICC uh, is a, a, a judicial institution operating in a political world. Um, although the, uh, the, 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 but uh, the world around us can be very political. Still, um, political matters should best be left to states and uh, such political venues as uh, Security Council. The court organs must remain vigilant in keeping uh, politics separate from the judicial proceedings. Once the situation comes before the court, we must let justice follow uh, its own course. Um, the, the, the court should uh, uh, be able to rely on states that created it to uh, shield it itself from political wins, um, especially the legal community as well as civil society um, should speak up on, on behalf of the court to defend the rule of law from interfer interference of uh, politics. Uh, they should uh, speak up especially when uh, the Nuremberg principles enshrined in the statute are threatened. Okay. Um, the ICC's activities cannot be turned on or off uh, according to the changing political priorities and the availability of funds. Um, the relationship between the court and the uh, states parties would have to be better streamlined uh, through uh, perhaps uh, more um, facilitations and subsidiary bodies of the ASP. Um, in addition to um, the, as you know, in addition to the court initiatives, the states uh, parties, the ASP uh, 
also created a roadmap to streamline um, discussions on amendments and other matters, but it has made the whole process very cumbersome and uh, difficult. Despite of increase in the number of court uh, submitted proposals, the ASP has adopted very few of them in the end because uh, it sticks to a consensus uh, rather than uh, vote on them. It is most important that states parties encourage each other to do more for the Rome statute system rather than micromanage the court. This, uh, that, uh, this is my view. Yeah, okay, <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much, Judge Song. Now I'm going to meld my words and see if you can read them. Uh, thanks very much, Judge Song. I think uh, your use of David Brooks' uh, quotation is uh, really uh, something we have to bear in mind as we face these really difficult issues, the collapse of the post-World War II order. Um, I want now to turn to Christian Benavesa, who's well known to this, uh, this audience and to this room, and ask Christian to address a, a few things. Um, uh, obviously, Christian uh, is uh, dealing extensively with the crime of aggression. It might be interesting to hear what his thoughts are in the coming 20 years uh, in addressing this. Um, Christian is the parent of the, uh, of the Triple IM, and it's now up and running. Um, we also have a, it's not a Triple IM, but a similar mechanism that the uh, Human Rights Council recently passed for uh, Myanmar, Burma, um, which uh, I think will be uh, moving forward in the relatively near future. And then, Christian, I'd really be interested in hearing your views on uh, the present crisis and how, uh, both with respect to human rights generally, but in particular the court, uh, how we weather the storm. So uh, if I can give you the floor, Christian. Thanks so much, <clears throat> David. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm um, <clears throat> very happy to take up the three points that, that, uh, that you have given me. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the crime of aggression, as, as you know, we uh, activated the jurisdiction over uh, this crime for the ICC in December, <clears throat> in December last year. And it was a decision that uh, was at the same time a difficult and an easy decision um, for for me, because it was um, it was accompanied by a provision um, that, in in my view, is not compatible with, with what the treaty says, and that I found very difficult to accept. Uh, at the same time, uh, I looked at the broad picture, and the broad picture to me was clearly that it was more important to have this done and the treaty completed and to have this on the books. And second, that it would probably only become more difficult in the future to try that again. And in thinking back uh, today, I have to say, today we would not even have to talk about activating the court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So it's good that it's on the books. Um, it is a, um, uh, a definition in particular that was extremely carefully negotiated, including with people um, in the room in a process that lasted, well, really eight years from 2002 to 2010 at, at the review conference uh, in Kampala. Uh, everything that has to do with the definition was negotiated by all states interested in that, including all states that are not parties to the Rome Statute. Um, at the Kampala conference, it was only states, uh, parties themselves that took the decision, which was a consensual decision, and again, in the process leading to that consensus, many non-state parties very strongly involved. Stephen Rapp was the co-head of the largest delegation in Kampala of the United States. Um, so if you hear people uh, trying to rewrite that history, mm -hmm. that is what you need to know. This is what happened. This was a very, uh, this was a very strong, uh, a very strong consensus. Now, where, where are we going to uh, go with this? Um, I think we're going to go um, slow with this. 
uh, I don't think that the court will have a case over an act and the crime of aggression anytime uh, soon, and I don't think that there is anything wrong with that. Uh, of course, if something particularly egregious happens where the court would be able to take on that role, it would be very important that it does so. But it, if, it does not hap if, if it does not happen, it does not mean that that was not, not an important decision. I think if we look at the state of our planet today, it is more important than ever to have legally binding rules on the legality of the use of force. Um, that, in effect, is what the Charter of the United Nations set out to do 70 years ago. And the Kampala Amendments complement the Charter of the United Nations in that they create individual criminal, criminal responsibility for individuals who violate the, uh, the prohibition of the illegal use of force. And that is really um, why this is so important. Uh, I think this will go into national penal codes. Uh, I think it's very important to, to disseminate the contents in particular of the definition. We have started conversations with uh, many, many partners, including, in fact, with the Security Council that has a primary and not exclusive role in making a determination uh, on an act of aggression. I also think it's very, very important to have an informed discussion on the issue of uh, cyber attacks and if and how or whether or not this is covered in the Kampala Amendments. I have my personal view on that. Uh, others have uh, their own, but that is a very, very important uh, discussion to have because as we all know, this is uh, unfortunately uh, the warfare, not just of the future, but probably, uh, probably already of the, of the present. Um, on, you, you mentioned the, the triple IM. I want to you know, frame this a bit more broadly. I think in, in looking forward, um, I have a hard time thinking of 20 years, uh, but in, in looking forward, uh, I think it's very important to think about alternatives to the ICC, because the reality is we will not have a Rome statute that is universally ratified in the next 20 years. And the reality is we will not have a Security Council that makes consistent um, referrals, and especially not referrals that we would like to see, namely backed up financially and politically, and I actually pretty strongly agree with those who say, well, maybe it's best not to have referrals, at least uh, with the Security Council, or at least for the time being. So if we look for alternatives, that does not mean that we don't believe in the ICC. I think quite the opposite. We go back to the core message of the ICC, namely the purpose of this treaty is to make sure that there is no impunity for these crimes. The purpose of this treaty is not that everybody ends up before the ICC. So, and the ICC will not be an option in all the cases. And if you look at the biggest crises that we are facing, be it Syria or be it Myanmar or be it Yemen, you always end up with the statement, well, the ICC does not have jurisdiction. And that can come as no surprise, in a way, if you remember the discussion we had yesterday about the make of, of the Rome Statute and where the court can exercise jurisdiction. So I think the important thing for us to do is to say, well, that does not mean we will just sit there and watch. We will still do something. And this is why we did what we did on Syria and on the Triple IM. Uh, this is a mechanism that is sort of de facto uh, a prosecutor's office, even though it does not have that name, and it prepares case files for prosecution in courts that can exercise jurisdiction. We are very happy that this uh, enjoys such broad political acceptance now. We are very happy that it was essentially copy-pasted um, for Myanmar. We hope that over time this may become a generic institution, but that is I think, you know, uh, we, we have a, a, a while to go there. We should not limit our thinking to, you know, now automatically every time there is a situation, oh, should there be a triple IM? There may be many cases where that is, that does not, is not the right fit. It does not fit the bill. I think we have to be open and, and creative and explore all the options that complementarity give to us. 
So there are other ways of addressing situations that pose different challenges. Um, and in particular, if you have situations where a government may be less unwilling, let's say, than the government of Syria obviously is, and less willing than obviously the government of Myanmar has been at least so far, then you can also think of, of very, very uh, different accountability um, models in the future. Third and finally, on you know, sort of where we are, um, I think if you, if you look at the ICC, uh, it's, it's, it's very important that we are not sort of sleepwalking through this discussion and not think about only, oh, you know, is it a 1.8% budget increase or is it a 2.4% budget increase? Because if the, at the end of the day, that will not make the difference for this institution. We have always supported giving the funds to the court that it needs, and we have always supported making sure that the, that the court uses its funds as efficiently as possible. We will, we will continue doing so. But the reality is that today, and I think that takes us back to what, what the Foreign Minister Ma said, we see a concerted assault on international institutions. So this is not about the ICC only, this is about many, many other institutions and treaties. And the ICC is probably the most vulnerable part in that discussion. Because this is, an, this is a vulnerable institution because it has a difficult mandate. It has the mandate to prosecute the most powerful people in the world. Because if you're able to commit a genocide and if you're able to orchestrate cri crimes against humanity, that means you are in a position of power. So if the court does not do that, it doesn't do its job. And the if the court does do that, it will always come under political attack. Because powerful people have power and they will use it against the court. And in the current climate, where we are moving very rapidly to a situation in which almost anything goes and impunity is actually the expectation sometimes this court really needs you know really needs to be defended and strengthened and and i think we all have to understand that this is not an institution that is in in The Hague and does its work, even though the institution itself, unfortunately, sometimes acts as just that. But this is our institution. We all own it. Not, you know, it's not my court, it's not Philip Kirsch's court, it's everybody's court in this room. And this is what people have to understand. So we certainly we have to come together in a different way to support this institution. And I think in a manner that is, can also be openly critical of the court where we can say we want to see a different kind of communication. We want to see a different kind of management and we want to see a strategy in prosecutions that we understand. And we have to have that conversation with the court and we have to have the conversation with each other in order to do that together. Thank you. One follow-up, Christian. Um, I think your last point is uh, is well taken, um, but what's the response so far from the court? I'm just uh, we uh, you say that the the court needs to respond. And how is that dialogue going in your view thus far? If you feel like commenting on it, yeah. I think we need to respond together with the court. Uh, you know, those who have said, some people here in the room have said. You know, it's not the prosecution. It's not the prosecutor that can have these conversations. I forget who it was, um, but I agree. It's not the prosecutor that can have these conversations. It has to be us. It has to be the states that own this institution. We are sometimes frustrated by what the court does quite openly, and sometimes it feels like it's an institution that does not want to be helped. Uh, <laughs> if I can that, so say that so That's candidly frankness. and openly. Yes. Um, but that is not my main point here. My main point here is that, you know, we cannot just sit there and micromanage the court and tie up its resources with that conversation and then come out and say, oh, you haven't done enough judicial work. Um, I'm, I will give you the floor. I, we're not, unfortunately, the clock is running fast on us, so um, we want to, we want, 
this is this is an accurate clock, right? Uh, mm, mm. I was afraid of that. <laughs> um, so we'll uh, we'll have a few more comments, but I have to open up to the floor in a minute. But I I promised you uh, one more bite at the apple, I think. So uh, if you have if you can make a few so short, brief. yeah, okay. briefly, please, yeah. Okay, thank you. I I I I did want to say more about some of my proposals, but I, maybe someone will ask me a question and I'll say more about that. But I, I did want to then let me just intervene in the discussion of what the court is. And I, I do think we need a more creative framework through which to think about the court. There are some who talk about the court as a system, and I think that that gets us closer. Of course, the court is not an, inst it isn't a, an institution or a building. It isn't simply something that exists in The Hague. If we can see the court as an assemblage, interconnected component parts that are interrelated to other things, from institutions to individuals to people to actions, to a range of things that produce other things, some of those other things include new institutions, some of them include uh, new innovations, and all of those things are the court. Um, they, they rep or they represent the ICC, they represent the domain, the, the international justice project. And if we can see it quite broadly, it means that you know, we are more than those of us here, certainly, and those of us in The Hague, that, that the process of domestication, of the implementation of those norms, itself produces a new set of relationships. And in fact, I, I like to think that the success of the court is, is in its ability to make itself irrelevant. And as we think about the future, and as we think about our aspirations, it might not be 20 years from now, it might not be 40 years from now, but through the system of domestication and the emergence of new bodies, of new institutions, of new um, political units even that, 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 pro that provide advisory, um, that work in an advisory capacity, that we will continue to see the justice project as much bigger than those parts, the, 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 the ICC being one of the fundamental component parts, but part of a larger justice project. And, and so I think even our imagination, the way that we think about what it is and what the future is and what we can imagine, means that we think about the, the ripple effect um, that, that these other, in these other sub-regions, the, the, these other innovations are actually part of what the Justice Project represents. And I think this is part of the, the discussion about our future. It is about what, one, what ideas become, and as they become, they change, they transform. And sometimes we don't like how they look when they transform into other things, but it's part of the process. And I say this just to say that in response to Justice Song's point, about um, an advisory committee for the nominations of the bench, et cetera. I, I think what we have to do is balance the inclination to micromanage who sits on the bench with uh, a, a democratic process in which regions elect or nominate. And this is very tricky, of course, and we don't want to reproduce elitism either, but we also want to make sure that that what it becomes is what we aspire, and, and some of that hopefully will be driven by the founding principles, and, and some, of the, some of it may not, and might lead to the emergence of other possibilities. And I, I guess that's an ongoing theme that I'm talking about in terms of the emergence of other things. But I think in, in our right to talk about the future, part of it is to imagine other possibilities. Do you have any, any organizations or uh, bodies that are emerging now that uh, you would point your finger to as ones to watch or uh, kind of uh, models for the future? Well, if not, it's okay. May maybe that's a rhetorical question, but I have to go back to the Malibu Protocol for the African Court and the, the possibilities around that. I won't revisit the details of that argument, but, um, but to simply say that an, an example is that Fakiso's point that um, it would be quite nice if ICC judges, um, if one of the chambers may uh, rec uh, recognize the, the work of um, genuine, uh, the, the process through which a, a genuine investigation might happen in a regional court, like the African court. But yes, we don't necessarily want to leave that to possibility, right? That, that, that perhaps the ICC will recognize a general investigation in a court that may one day uh, uh, be in force. That in fact, you know, part of the, 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 
what is being asked for is an amendment so that the ICC can, and this is the AU, this isn't me, but the, IC, the, the AU is asking for an amendment so that regional bodies are recognized in the complementarity discussion and vice versa, because the Malibu Protocol for the African Court doesn't recognize the ICC. So it means that we would need um, cooperation agreements, that we would need some kind of amendment so there is a, a technical rec recognition of both bodies. That doesn't exist. So that's an example of some of the future work through which we might think about these things. Thank you very much. We have 20 minutes and 11 seconds. So um, we'll, we'll open up the floor and I'll take all the questions at once and then uh, we'll get answers. And I, I see uh, David Sheffer's hand up, I think. Uh, Just a very short question for Uh, just a very short question for uh, uh, Judge Song. Um, with the arrival of the crime of aggression um, and your comments about uh, selection of judges in the future, does this introduce a new dynamic whereby at the next election of judges, the criteria of having at least one or two judges with deep public international law knowledge of aggression and the law of force, armed force and conflict, in public international law as opposed to criminal law might become a more dominant feature in the next election so that at least there's one or two judges on the bench who actually have a very deep background in, in uh, uh, the, you know, the, the experience in world history of aggression and how it plays out both in political science, international relations, and of course law. So um, there are a couple of more. Let's take, let's take uh, Jim and Bill and Allison, I think. Is that, my, my vision's not so great. Okay. Um, could we yeah. pass the I microphone? Got, got. Oh, you've, you've got a microphone. Right? I do, David. Thank you so much. And thank you for using yours. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and this is a great panel. Um, thank you so much. It's really inspiring. Um, and uh, my wish for the next 20 years is that uh, we have uh, dozens more um, ambassadors um, who can speak with the thoughtfulness and the intelligence that we've just heard and that we have heard during the course of this meeting from those um, uh, diplomatic officials present. Um, I think that kind of uh, thoughtfulness is really needed uh, to tackle the challenges we're facing. But I wanted to pick up on one point that was raised and address two others very briefly. One, you, David, your question about economic justice um, um, and that you were having a colloquy on, I think it's of course critical that we as a world address issues of economic justice, but in my view that doesn't mean the ICC is the tool to do that or even that international criminal law is the best way to do that. I think it's important to re retain sight of the distinction between reparations for specific crimes on the one hand and broad ranging economic and social justice uh, on the other and if we believe that widening economic inequalities in some places are sparking a rise of illiberalism then let's deal with that but let's not put all the burden on international criminal law to be the tool for dealing with that that would just be my take on that um, Secondly, in relation to the increasingly public nature of the threats to the court, some are suggesting it's important now to wait, to be prudent, to stay on the sidelines, not to provoke an overreaction. Um, there are, of course, times when quiet diplomacy is needed, but this is not one of them. Um, I think the danger here is that silence will be understood as weakness or worse, acquiescence to um, the destruction of the international norms and institutions that many have fought so hard for. And then finally, I would urge humility as to content and creativity, if not radicalism, as to tactics and strategy. By which I mean, I don't think we need more ideas about how to expand the jurisdiction of the court, new crimes for it to address, etc. I think we need to be a lot more imaginative about advocacy of how to defend it and the mission of international justice going forward. Thanks. I have an answer to you too, but Bill, I think, uh, and be brief, please. Uh, very quickly. First, I just wanted to let people know that Barbara Lockmiller has been one of the finest supporters yeah. of uh, the rule of law and international affairs in, in the European Union. 
uh, from the very beginning when she was still working with Amnesty here and Wilpf in, in Geneva. Uh, uh, I, it's, it's, uh, we have really uh, benefited from your leadership and, and wise advice and it's tragic to hear that you're fairly certain that the European Union is going to go a bit in reverse perhaps on these issues and so I hope we can do what we can do to try and stop that. On the Malibu Convention, I think it is extremely important. We've been working with Don Dea and others uh, for years. Uh, it hasn't helped that they put in this provision now to exempt uh, senior government officials and, and, and give immunity to, to heads of state, et cetera. But I do agree that the breadth and scope of, the, of that regional court is something to fundamentally try to, to work for and, and, and support. And just uh, Judge Song, last thing on the Advisory Committee on Nominations, my sense is that the, I, I know uh, the Chairman, Kirsch and others have tried to get the Bureau to agree to allow them to be more uh, robust in their uh, assessments. And I think it's something that uh, as an ex-president, uh, it would be very good for you to get that, as you were doing today, public and other, other, other uh, we, we will help do that. And, uh, but, but I do think that mechanism is very important. And uh, again, I think the last, last point is that the linking the threats to the International Criminal Court and the Rome Statute system to the threats to uh, multilateralism writ large, I think, is a fundamentally valuable uh, uh, way to proceed. Okay. So. Uh, Allison. Thank you. Uh, Allison Smith with uh, No Peace Without Justice. Um, I had several questions, but I'm only going to ask one because I don't want David to be looking at me in that way. So, <laughs> my question... Very few people have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> my question is actually to, to Barbara, and it's about the, the, the work of the European Parliament towards an EU special representative on IHL and international justice. Uh, I think that this is a, could be a really useful tool in terms of strengthening the ability of the EU to respond to international justice needs and as you know, we are very supportive of it as are other civil society members and um, I think it would be useful to hear more, also it's, it could be instructive for other regional organisations uh, such as those mentioned by Judge Song. And finally to ask, is there anything people outside of Europe such as people inside this room could do uh, to assist uh, with that campaign? Thank you. I know there are more questions, but I think we'll take this round and see if we have any time. And I would, just to address Jim's question, I didn't mean to imply that I thought that the questions of social and economic rights shouldn't necessarily be part of the ICC. I think the human rights movement has failed to address those issues systematically, and this is one of the reasons that we are facing this populist reaction. I did a speech on this a week or two ago, and I'm, it's going to be published, and I'll send it to you. But that is my overriding point. Um, um, but uh, I don't think it's for the, for the court. But I think it is for the human rights movement to take this on in a serious way. And if we don't, we're, we're really in deep trouble. I don't feel strongly about this, obviously. Um, why don't we, uh, Barbara, you were mentioned a, a, a few times, so why don't I give you the floor first? Yeah, thank you. On um, establishing a EU special representative for international humanitarian law and international justice, uh, this is also the demand of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And uh, in our resolutions in the Parliament, we got the majority to demand this. We had this in 2011 but it didn't translate. So the, our external action service, they do not want to have more position uh, like the special representative on human rights. And now, again, at the end of the term, we try to make an other effort, particularly the general threat against international law. And uh, we were 34 MEPs from different parties, mostly the center left, I have to say. Um, but still, we are, if we are together, we can have a majority. We have sent a letter to uh, Mogherini and to the others and demand this, but her response was not uh, positive so far. So certainly um, we should include this in our election campaign and after the election campaign. Also the NGOs have to be very quick uh, to reach out to those who have a lead in the parliament and to push for this. And maybe I add just we have another problem 
uh, that the British are leaving in March most likely. So the overall budget of the EU will be roughly less than 12%. And already the battle is open <laughs> uh, who, uh, how this budget will be uh, uh, divided. And so again, it will be also the question, I haven't, I have forgotten to say, that the EU was also of, of, of great financial support to the ICC and other organizations who support it. And I think it will be an uphill uh, battle to get the same amount or even more after the elections. Thank you. Uh, probably um, one can um, just um, <clears throat> uh, spend uh, many hours to discuss this issue. Uh, therefore, I'm not going to uh, uh, tell you what, uh, what the best criteria or qualification or uh, competition of the court and criteria and qualification of judges uh, should be uh, for the uh, for the ICC. But uh, instead, I'll just uh, tell you my observation uh, when I, I worked for uh, the ICC. The, the first stage in judges uh, had uh, different backgrounds. Uh, some were uh, judges. Some were just. Uh, Diplomats. Some others were uh, professors and practicing attorneys, and, and uh, all that. Um, but since this is a court, a criminal court, uh, especially those who will be assigned to the uh, trial on pretrial group, uh, the uh, chambers sh should be well equipped with uh, some criminal trial experiences. I mean, some, uh, some colleagues have never even seen a, a criminal trial in their whole life, yet uh, they are assigned to a, a certain chamber to do the uh, necessary judicial work. This was a bit, um, uh, you know, I just uh, thought of this a uh, number of times it, it may not be uh, uh, workable, may not be workable uh, in, in the uh, best way we hope. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the other day, uh, Hans Corell indicated uh, that, uh, you know, alluded to this issue in a way. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, international law experts who had an ample experience of Rome conference and uh, other, uh, uh, along that line would uh, you know were good uh, members of the first uh, 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 the uh, judiciary uh, because of their experience but uh, here and after you know the, the judges uh, with the really hands with hands on a trial experience that should be elected to uh, fill the, uh, the ICC uh, chambers. Um, yes, uh, I, I, while I agree uh, with him uh, on this point, but um, as far as the, the appeal chamber of the ICC is concerned, it's not uh, the bad idea to have uh, somebody, uh, even though he or she didn't even had any chance to uh, look at the trial, criminal trial, it's, a, it's still a good idea to have one or two, uh, you know, this um, qualified uh, people well equipped with the general international law uh, knowledge. Uh, it is those uh, members who usually uh, come, came up with the uh, very uh, necessary contributions at the deliberation times. I, I, I thought uh, their views, uh, their contributions were very, very uh, useful in, uh, in formulating the appeal chamber's view uh, in, in reality. That's the reality. Thanks very much. Christian, did you have a final? Yeah, just very briefly to David's question. I think the answer is clearly yes. I think we need people with a specific expertise. Um, it's a crime that is different in nature from the other crimes, and I think we need to have that. We already had those conversations with candidates last time. 
around. It was not always a happy experience, I have to say. Um, and I think it's very important what he said, Jim, that, you know, uh, this is not the moment to be silent. You don't have to uh, respond specifically to anyone who said something, but you should be able to stand up, um, stand up in front of this institution. And again, as, you know, as, as we framed it during Halloween Week, as High Commas framed it, this is just part of a larger uh, assault on, on uh, multilateralism. There was one more question. We have five minutes, and I think somebody had their hand up. Uh, oh, no. Oh. Two, but somebody back, no? Okay. Erica and uh, Richard. Oh, she, she, you had your hand up first. So. They may have to be more like statements, but uh, uh, so yeah. brief, yeah, thank you. Dziecio uh, um, Maybe I would say some things that um, some people would not like. But we need to be open and to say true that uh, countries lost interest in criminal law, in cr international criminal court. Look how many state parties, I am not speaking about non-state parties, celebrating 20th anniversary. How much is the newspapers, how much events are taking. I am speaking about my country, Latvia, uh, how many people from my country came to some trips to ICC, ministers, judges, and everything? Nothing in the press, nothing on TV, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I think what uh, uh, Van Weser uh, said, we need to say this openly. We need to speak with the ministers of foreign affairs, justice. You are coming every year, twice a year, to ASP meeting. You are sending these people to this meeting. You need to ask from them what they learned. I ask many times when it was 10th anniversary of ICC, there should be article in Latvian um, newspapers about anniversary. No, nobody, even people who are coming, they are coming and then doing other things. And I think we need to be open. It's 124 or 23 countries, yeah? yeah? What we are doing to support this. Yeah. Regarding elections, uh, uh, I think it's very good that we have this now board, uh, some selection. But now I was in uh, Syracuse in memorial uh, of uh, Basuni, Professor Basuni. I met candidate from uh, Croatia. And she told me that all candidates who were not recommended by this committee were elected. You know? Yeah, but most of them. So uh, we can give any advice who could be judges. Who I think it's uh, time also came for some ethics also in di diplomacy and everything. Yeah. Everything is interconnected. Yeah. Here, may, many devoted people, yeah? yeah. And uh, we have yeah. this ICC, wonderful ICC, some laboratory, yep. uh, how other called uh, uh, yeah. doing. So I think we... I, we, I think your point is a good one. It's a yeah. call to, to action. You. And uh, uh, <laughs> I think, you're, I think we, uh, we all have more to do. So I appreciate your intervention. And I, I'm afraid that we are um, out of time. Um, I want to thank the great panelists and for their interventions, and I wish we had a couple of more hours. Uh, but I think you guys are getting hungry and uh, tired. And I want to thank the Academy, uh, and great job, and all of that. So, oh, and Judge Smith. Yeah, sure. oh, yeah.